The next session is a panel discussion on Indian retail investors meeting their expectations. Uh, the participants of this are, it is, this session is going to be moderated by Mr. Anurag Bansal, who is the Secretary of BSE Brokers Forum, Mr. Nehal Hura, NDN CEO CDSL, Mr. Navneet Mulok, CIO SBI Mutual Fund, and Mr. Nitin Kamat, founder of Zero Dha, who has been a disruptor in his own right. Over to you, Anurag Good morning. Waiting for uh, go ahead from Ujwal. Yes, please. Okay, can we start? Yes. Got all the panelists here? Yes. Okay, great. So good morning and welcome to our first panel discussion of BBF IFIE India Investor Show 2020. Uh, my name is Anurag Bansal. I'm director of SMC Global Securities Limited and secretary BSE Brokers Forum. And I'm honored to have with me today a distinguished panel of guests. Uh, we have Namit Munoz, CIO SBI Asset Management Company Limited, Nitin Kamat, Jiroda and Nail Vora, MD and CEO Central Depository Services Limited. Uh, I know all our participants are eager to hear from the panelists. Uh, in case participants have any questions, they can uh, ask by typing in the appropriate box on their screen, and we will take those questions at the end of the session. Uh, let me start with complimenting the regulator SEBI for proactively initiating a lot of measures to strengthen the capital markets and boost the confidence of investors in the last three decades. Infrastructure institutions like stock exchanges, clearing corporations, depositories, along with other market participants like mutual funds and intermediaries, including stock brokers, have played a significant role during this development. The role of uh, all is worth special mention that during lockdown, Everyone burned midnight oil to ensure that capital markets function very smoothly. And that too, despite the fact that many regulatory changes were introduced during and around this period. The result of all these efforts is visible in number of new investor accounts added since April 2020 till date. Mutual funds, in fact, in first six months of this year have added over three and a half million folios with net increase in assets by over four and a half lakh crores. Similarly, around 1 million trading and DMAT accounts have been opened every month in the first six months of this financial year. These are really encouraging numbers. Uh, friends, Indian capital market has a history of 140 odd years. Uh, but as I said earlier, we have seen a lot of changes and reforms only in the last three decades. In year, 90, in year 1990, when there was outside system of trading, one could not imagine that there will be something like screen-based trading depository system and dematerialization in next 10 years and the issue of transparency and bad deliveries will disappear. In year 2000, one could never envisage that future and options will be introduced and it will lead the market in next 10 years. In year 2010, one could not foresee that mutual funds on the back of retail investment shall be able to counter FPI outflows and technology will be such a great game changer that you should be able to use your smartphone to do almost anything relating to your investments. So one of the uh, lead questions that I'll seek answer from all the panelists today in 2020 is what major regulatory or non-regulatory change do you foresee coming in the next 10 years, which will probably change the whole investor experience. So with this background, I move to the panel. Uh, let me start with Navneet. Uh, Navneet. India is considered to be a country of savers and financial investments have historic, historically taken a backseat as compared to investment into bank, bank deposits, investment into real estate and investment into gold. We shall be delighted if you can highlight the role of capital markets and mutual funds in particular in channelizing retail investments into productive assets. Have we been successful in the task of creating sizable investor base considering, considering the population of our country? And have you met their expectations? 
I'll also request you to answer my earlier question about big changes that you foresee coming in next 10 years. This is yours, Namneet. Take your time. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Anurag, and sincere compliments to BSE Brokers Forum for a wonderful event. It was so nice to hear Mr. Uh, Bajaj's views, uh, which he put so eloquently, and particularly the two T's, which are most important, trust and technology. And I'm sure those are the two things that we are going to spend the most amount of time on uh, uh, during the day. Uh, over the, and, and it, it's so nice to hear the 140 year history of capital markets in India. In fact, it goes back centuries. India has been one of the, uh, uh, I would say most prosperous as well as the biggest trading partner for a large part of the world for centuries. And I'm sure over the next century really belongs to us. Over the last 25 years, there are very few countries in the world which have achieved something like this. Almost, I mean, if you look at a period between, let's say, 94 to 2019, 25 year period where nominal GDP grew at around 12 or 13 percent, corporate profits grew around 13 percent, and market capitalization grew around 14 or 15 percent. Not many countries in the world can boast of something like that. Consistently, a higher growth and a corporate sector which could convert that growth into profits which even a small investor with few hundred or few thousand rupees could participate in. And I think not many countries in the world have been able to achieve that. I mean, everybody knows why we have grown uh, at such a high rate for a long period of time, whether it's the democracy, it's the demographic, it's the demand. And now with the fourth powerful force digitalization, I remain more confident about the next 25 years because unlike several other countries, the growth has been driven by the entrepreneurs. It also resulted in high corporate profits with focus on return on capital employed. And thanks to vibrant capital markets, Markets, a history of capital markets, but huge number of, I would say, the institution building, innovation, and the hard work of all the participants. And, and Mr. Bajaj very eloquently, I think, mentioned right from the regulator to the role of stock exchanges, depositories, all the intermediaries, legal systems, so on and so forth. That a small investor who would have put thousand rupees 25 years back in a mutual fund could participate in in that growth of the of the uh, country. Over the next several years, as I mentioned that I remain quite confident about the structural growth and I'm sure large number of investors would be able to participate in that growth. You mentioned about the high savings rate. Yes, India uh, historically always had very high savings rate, but we had a challenge in channelizing those savings into the capital market because historically a large part of those savings have gone into physical assets like real estate and gold and within the financial savings also a very large part actually has been in bank deposits or actually hard cash which is also a large part of our our financial savings there have been some periods like 86 to 96 where i think if i remember correctly the ownership of shares and debentures increased there was this period of 2006 to 8 again we saw a, a much higher proportion of savings coming into the capital markets but i think we have a very very long way to go i think with the uh, increased awareness with all the other measures that have been taken over the last several years and stupendous work done by all participants starting with the market regulator uh, to mutual fund industry to all the intermediaries whether it's the brokers or uh, the stock or the other institutions like stock exchanges, advisors, distributors, media. The MF penetration has been increasing. The mutual fund Sahi campaign is is hitting the right notes. I'm sure people who have been watching IPL are also getting the right investor education messages uh, uh, through the mutual fund Sahi campaign. And uh, otherwise, also I think the mutual fund Sahi campaign or the investor education awareness program of the industry along with the regulator and industry body has tried to reach out to crores of investors across the nook and corner of the country. The SIP flows, uh, systematic investment flows, which were around 5,000 crores or so near about uh, a decade back per annum. Uh, and now we are talking about uh, uh, something like uh, seven and a half thousand crores per month. In fact, they touched a peak of one lakh crore rupees per annum. They have come down a little bit over the last few months, but I remain confident uh, we have a long way to go. Despite all the volatility and this crisis, large number of investors, or I would say majority of investors 
have remained highly disciplined. There is a message that it's the time in the market, not the timing in the market, which is critical. And I think large number of investors, thanks to the role played by all the participants, have maintained that discipline. The overall assets have grown from 10 lakh crores around five or six years, six years back to almost 28 lakh crores, so two and a half, three times, eight and a half crore folios of mutual fund industry, two crore SIP folios, and over a billion dollar a month. There's been a lot of innovation. I think investors, depending on their goals, can participate in, 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 in different kinds of products to meet their goals. I mean, parking funds for a few days. Uh, uh, you can you can have a money market fund to, let's say, for a long-term wealth creation, whether it's the child's education, or retirement savings. I think the, the fund industry has been able to come out with uh, innovation in terms of product, providing the right product. Uh, I mean, I always say this, for a product for every reason, a product for every season. There's been a lot of innovation, uh, which is yet pending, particularly, for example, in US, where money market funds, people like Charles Schwab and Fidelity and so many of them run trillions of dollars in money market funds, which becomes an entry gate for large number of investors who then start participating in other products. I hope, I mean, in India, we can have sweet products like that and they become very large. Uh, the other innovation uh, is actually in the area of, I would say, risk management, where the focus has been for last several years has been on risk adjusted returns. We have seen an unusual, unpredictable, unprecedented time, not only in last few quarters, but in last few years. But notwithstanding few mishaps here and there, by and large, the industry has been able to meet expectations of the investors across uh, asset classes, across products. But no crisis should be allowed to go waste. And again, from this crisis, industry is learning the right lessons and I'm sure we'll be able to meet uh, investors' expectation, particularly in the area of technology. I mean, my friend Nitin is there. I'm looking forward to, to listen to him and I'm sure uh, across all spheres of financial services, that's something I think all of us need to work a lot more. Building trust is very critical. Uh, I think by and large, I think in terms of transparency, in terms of disclosure standards, in terms of the overall ethical standards, I think our industry, I mean, even if I compare with a uh, lot of other markets in the world, rank pretty high. But of course, there is, there is always a scope for improvement and industry is working I'm, I'm with the regulators and trying to improve on all of these counts that I uh, that I mentioned. While we can pat on the back for where we have reached today, I told you about 5,000 crore per month of SIP flows to almost now seven and a half, eight thousand crores of per month SIP flows. We have talked about the folios, but we have a long way to go. Despite all the efforts, if you look at unique investors, while there are eight crore folios, but I mean there is no. Uh, count available, but I guess maybe around two and a half, three crore unique investors industry has been able to reach out so far. Uh, now you compare that with a billion plus mobile subscribers and the number of people who have the smartphones. You compare with, let's say, the people who own a two wheeler, you compare that with, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the penetration of most of the other things. Uh, it's still very, very small, and we have a long way to go. All of us have to work a lot harder on on keep uh, building on this whole awareness program, mutual fund say is striking the right uh, note. I think advisors are doing a good job in terms of ensuring that they focus on holistic financial planning and not on, on pushing products, but we need to leave from. And that's where I think the two T's that he mentioned about, and I would reinforce uh, the importance of how do we build trust in the market? How do we gain trust of each and every investor when they are giving their savings to meet their dreams, to meet their goals over the long run. And I think it's a collective responsibility. It is not only the responsibility of policymakers or regulator, but it's a collective responsibility of each and every participant uh, in the financial markets, in the financial system to ensure that we don't do anything which breaches the trust of the investor and keep working harder and harder. And second part, of course, is that, that technology which we need to leverage a lot more. In fact, a lot of things got tested in last few months, particularly in this COVID crisis when the world moved from physical to virtual. I think industry has done a very good job. Everybody rose to the occasion, right from the stock exchanges to the depositories to mutual funds to brokers to everybody. And, and, and everybody has done a very, very good job. But I think to ensure that we leverage the power of technology and increase the penetration a lot more, whether it's creating the investor awareness 
or, 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 or reaching the right kind of product penetration. We have a lot more to do. I'll just end by saying that there are certain powerful forces that we are seeing in the economy, whether it's the formalization of the economy, whether it's the digitalization of the economy, whether it's digitalization of finance, whether it's financialization of savings, whether it's financialization of assets, uh, in terms of products like REITs or INVITs, I think a lot of other innovations that are happening. And with all the other structural factors which are very much in place, if you look at the world in the new geopolitical alignment, with all the structural reforms that have been undertaken in the last few years, I remain very confident about the growth potential of India for a long time to come. We are on our way to become a $5 trillion economy, and there, Capital markets will play a very, very important role. In fact, a large part of legislative agenda, a lot of other reforms, I would say, has been uh, uh, done, has been achieved. Now the focus has to be, how do we penetrate uh, uh, financial services a lot more? We had a great success uh, in, in, in Jan Dhan Yojana, and I hope that all of us work together and, and with the blessings of policymakers that we take the Jan Dhan Yojana to the next logical step, which should be a Jan Nivesh Yojana. And as Gandhiji said that, even if there is tears in one person's size, my work is not complete. And I think it's a collective responsibility of all of us in the capital markets to ensure that till that time, we are not able to create wealth or to be able to meet the financial goal of every single Indian. We have not really achieved our vision or we have not really done our, our job right. And I think all of us need to work with that sense of purpose, that sense of passion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Namneet, for answering all my three questions together. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'll come back to you. Before that, let me reach to Nehal. Uh, Nehal, Indian capital markets have seen its journey in the last 140 years from under a shed of, uh, under a banyan tree, uh, to a sophisticated and anonymous trading system. Uh, can you highlight various regulatory changes that have taken place over a period of time and how the role played by MIIs and depositories was significant? And with your background experience in private sector, with the regulator, with the stock exchange, and now head, head of depository, probably you are the best person to answer my key question about what big regulatory or known regulatory change do you foresee coming in next 10 years? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anurag. Uh, I'd like to really thank BBF for this fabulous event. Uh, I've been here since morning and I think it has been very rich in content. Uh, thank you, Navneet, for that very, very elaborate uh, um, thoughts which you presented in a very structured manner. Uh, in terms of uh, where we, we were and where we have been, uh, I remember in the mid 1990s uh, when we had just moved from uh, the physical floor to um, the electronic floor and really alok uh, who's here would be witness to that is that uh, the brokers had resisted this change they had gone on strike for 15 days uh, where they did not want uh, the physical floor to be really abandoned now if you see the mirror out here uh, there on a good day 400 crores of volume for the BSC, that MBSC was the principal exchange, the country, uh, was considered to be a very, very successful day. Now, today, when you fast forward to 2020, there is a single broker, and really in Nitin Kamath is here, so he will be a witness to that. He poses margins, which is in excess of 400 crores. So I think these are the kind of the huge exponential growth which the industry has seen so what is the core underlying theme and uh, the point which uh, uh, mr bajaj made in the inaugural session and navneet also touched upon on his thing are the two d's is technology and trust now the real core theme between technology and trust is the regulation i always compare securities market to the game of cricket uh, you know uh, the role of the umpire is the most underrated role in the game of cricket. We always look at the batsman, the bowler, the fielder, the commentators, the audience. But it's the role of the umpire which brings them all together in one place. 
Now, if you look at that, we all uh, in some form or the other used to play cricket when as children in the building and the batting team's non-player would become the umpire. The audience used to just be one or two people. And you move forward to uh, Gymkhana cricket or a Ranji cricket, there you have a kind of a semi-professional umpire. The audience grows from those two players to probably 20, 25 people. And when you move towards uh, international game, you have professional umpires who are only doing the job of umpiring. Uh, they are on the field, so they are in the market, but they are not participating in it. They are just giving their judgment on every ball which is being played, whether it's a no ball, whether it's a four or six, or uh, if a person is out. Similarly, uh, the role of the umpire now, as the role of the umpire grows, there's a human element. So that's where technology has come in. So you have a role of a third umpire, which has come, which says that uh, the human errors could occur in the process of umpiring. And therefore, you need technology to look at the past trends, the audit trails, and then come to a conclusion. And now you have something called a DRS, where the uh, party who has been affected can challenge the decision of the umpire so making the role of umpiring accountable and can reverse the umpire will be forced to reverse the decision based on technology what has this led to a stupendous growth of viewership a stupendous growth of audience because there is trust and technology which has come into play because now you feel that there is technology which doesn't which cannot lie which does not need to sleep which is going to tell you the truth and can process large amount of data into itself Really, this is the core ethos of regulation in the securities market. Today, we are looking at, uh, you know, we all are happy to look at uh, probably seven to eight crore investors uh, which are in the securities market. But the banking side, you have 75 crore fans which are yet there. So there are tenfold increase which is possible. In the insurance sector, we have another uh, few crores which are unique, which are not there in the uh, securities market, pensions, you have such thing. So what is that core driving factor is, in my opinion, three core themes. First is the process of account opening. And this is where the government has done a very, very important uh, reform is ensuring that Aadhaar based, Aadhaar becomes the core driver in account opening. So today, CDSL, CVL, both have been uh, approved as uh, using Aadhaar for uh, opening of the DMAT accounts. Uh, we are in the, pro in the final processes of getting the approvals uh, from the agencies to start using this after the Supreme Court verdict. So that is going to ensure that, again, technology comes into play, bringing in trust that you have another identified agency called UIDAI which is whose data is going to be leveraged upon in opening of the DMAT account, opening of the trading account, brings in a lot of integrity and trust into the system. The second theme is the transaction ability moving from a telephone-based market, from a physical market to a telephone-based market to now an internet-based market and a mobile-based market, where it is DIY, do it yourself, rather than relying on anybody. I remember in my days in Merrill, uh, there was a large broker in Tokyo who none of the uh, core investment banks, so Merrill had not even seen who was behind that. And the brokerage earned in those times, as I'm talking about in 2006, 7 was probably 3 or $4 billion a year. When they used to, so that's the kind of trading which used to happen. Now, why was this possible? Because there was direct market access. People like to be in control of the transactions which they are doing, and they need accountability. They need information flow coming back to them. And this is another core uh, key uh, flow which we are putting into play. That the MIS today, though it's a B two B model, the information flow is B two C, where it directly flows into the customers account it put, that directly flows into the customer's mobile device that brings in a lot of integrity now drawing the analogy to the game of cricket when the uh, drs 
is actually uh, uh, put on the screen. People are seeing it for themselves and they are judging whether the person is out or not out. And that brings in a lot of accountability into the system. That brings in a lot of participation into the system. So this is the other point which uh, I feel is the second key point. And the third is uh, the very important reform which SEBI has put in place is called market infrastructure institutions. Now, if you see it till uh, the mid 2015 or so, uh, exchanges used to uh, historically be a mutualized exchange, which was, uh, you know, as a common joke goes for the brokers, by the brokers, of the brokers, where the regulation was part of the exchange system, ecosystem. It had its own utility at that point of time, but the important thing was the regulation part got segregated. The clearing and settlement part, which was part of the exchange system, got segregated into something called a clearing corporation. And the depository role got segregated into a third thing, which was a separate uh, market infrastructure institution. Now, if you look at all these three, they perform clear, distinct roles in the area of umpiring of the securities markets whether it be in the price discovery, which the exchanges do, to the settlement risk and the novation uh, function, which the clearing corporations do, to the holding of digital assets in a secured uh, registry for every investor, which a depository does. This kind of an umpiring role, once it is segregated, it brings in a lot of resiliency and robustness into the system because no institution is too big to fail. But at the same time, there is collective wisdom, which is really ensuring the policing or the umpiring of the markets. But to this, to ensure that they perform well, there needs to be a complementary role where there is information sharing in a systematic and a systemic basis through the need of technology, where exchanges data flows in into clearing corporations, flows into depositories. And the process which Navneet mentioned of risk management is where there has to be collective wisdom because surveillance alerts, risk management alerts, investor fraud alerts can occur at any point of time. So you have multiple eyes looking at it and then there is sharing of information that happens. This kind of multiplies the entire role of umpiring. Again, drawing an analogy of cricket, if you had an umpire with every player, with every fielder, with every batsman, the whole integrity of the system will grow much higher. That's the kind of the analogy which you grow uh, where we are looking at the securities market because there are multiple matches being played simultaneously. It's not one single match where the umpire has to focus on. The last point which I would like to see, at least from a future standpoint, is uh, which Navneet again mentioned was about Jan Dhan. I think the single DMAT account is going to be the most important uh, reform which we are looking at going forward. That all financial assets are going to come under one DMAT account. What is that going to lead to? A, it's going to lead to a very powerful know your client process because your banking KYC, your securities market KYC, your pension market KYC, and your insurance market KYC is all going to get integrated. So any change in your KYC is going to get globally affected on all your financial assets. Second is the entire market of pledging and repledging. You know, this is just a tip of the iceberg with the securities market, the margin pledge system, which SEBI has just recently introduced. Why can't that go on to all your financial assets? And look at the power which margin pledge brings in, because you are not parting with the physical, uh, the physical visibility of your asset but you can visualize the financialization of your assets where it is getting pledged with multiple players. So the fraud aspect is kind of eliminated. Transparency is brought in, but more importantly, it leads to uh, where you can leverage upon your financial assets. And the third most important thing in single DMAT account is a process of nomination. Today, if I want to safeguard my assets and also nominate my assets after I'm no more, it becomes in a very efficient manner in which we can put it across to all the sorts of uh, the investors. This is going to bring in a lot of trust. 
and we can leverage upon the hard work done by the banking sector, insurance sector, securities market sector, and the pension sector to interplay with each other that each of these would grow where it leads to the overall well-being of the citizens of India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil, for beautifully connecting cricket to our regulations uh, and also giving us a hint of what we are expecting in future. Uh, I'll come back to you. Uh, let me move now to the biggest game changer of broking industry, Nitin Kamat. Uh, Nitin, an investor's door to capital market is open through a stock broker. May I request you to highlight role of brokerages in the capital markets and also throw some light on the developments that are currently happening in the industry and where do you see broking industry in the next 10 years? Thank you. Over to you, Nitin. Nitin, you are on mute. Could you unmute yourself, please? Okay. Uh, is this better? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Anurag. Uh, thanks, BBF, uh, for having me on this. Uh, no, I, I get I get asked this question, uh, Nathan. Why do you do what do you do in life, right? As in, what is what is your true north, and uh, why build a brokerage business? Because, uh, like today, we consider ourselves to be a technology business, and broking is almost incidental to the technology business, and and not vice versa, right? And uh, now, why be a broker? I mean, see, I think I. Like every every time you know we do well, I think uh, every new initiative that we are doing, we are doing it with an intent to grow the capital markets in, in this country, right? And uh, my belief is that if India as a country has to grow, you know, financialization is the key, uh, and uh, and you know you need to get more people to be backing Indian entrepreneurs versus keeping money in bank, real estate, gold, or whatever, right? As in, you you need that money to be coming behind entrepreneurs, so entrepreneurs can go build great businesses. And in turn, help the country grow, right? So that's that's really my like my true north in sense, like you know why I'm doing what I'm doing, etc. Right? And uh, uh, yeah, so I uh, so one is that. Now two is uh, while you know we talk about potential market sizes, I think I think there's a bigger problem in this country, which is uh, most of our country doesn't really have enough money to invest, right? I think uh, you know uh, uh, while you know while we can enable those who can invest to invest in the markets. Uh, see, the thing is, for example, five crore Indians have filed income tax returns, right? As in three crore Indians have actually filed any taxes. And right? now it's, it's very tough to, like, you know, when you think about growing this market ecosystem, as in how do you grow beyond five crores? If people are not making money, how will they actually save invest, right? Um, so, so it's kind of one of those chicken and egg situations. Uh, so, you know, if you want more people to earn money, you need more entrepreneurs, right? Because more entrepreneurs will get, build great businesses. In turn, you know, the number of people who can potentially uh, save, invest, increases, right? So, uh, so yeah, so that's that's essentially, uh, you know, personally my, uh, I think, what brokers are, are actually doing. You know, of course, we have customers who do day trading. We have customers who do futures and options trading, right? But then that's par for the course, as in that's not really the, you know, uh, I mean, that helps us subsidize, uh, our main goal of actually going and growing the capital market ecosystem in this country. And uh, uh, I think uh, while we talk about how, uh, you know, a lot of product innovation has happened, you know, because of technology over the last three, four years, I think the biggest tipping point for us uh, as an industry or even for businesses like us was Aadhaar, right? As in there is no way in hell we could have done what we have done. Uh, you know, if this year we have added a million counts every every uh, every month the reason a million have been added is because maybe 900000 of them have been open online right there was no way you could have gotten you know people to go pick up a document piece of document sign a 40 page right when when there was uh, the whole world was locked down right so i think uh, i like i'm i'm supremely excited with all the regulatory changes that have been happening uh, while it you know in the short term it hurts the revenue right as in uh, but i think 
uh, in the long run, what is good for the customer is good for the industry and for brokers, right? I mean, uh, you know, you have to look at it that way uh, because like, for example, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people watching this are brokers and uh, and we are all probably preparing ourselves on how December 1st will be when intraday leverages, you know, restrictions kick in, right? Uh, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of us will be hurt, but uh, but I think I think uh, the takeaway here is that all the regulatory changes that have happened in the, in the last two, three years, they're good for the customer. And, and, you know, historically, if you go and look at any industry where regulatory changes have happened, what is good for the customer has eventually helped the businesses grow within the industry, right? So, uh, so yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, the other question that you asked of what regulatory changes that you foresee in the future, uh, I mean, I hope not too many changes happen because, you know, we brokers are struggling to cope up with what is what, what are being changed. Uh, but but one of the questions that I personally ask myself is that, you know, with all the changes that are happening, is there one day where we wake up and we say, why do you even need stockbrokers, right? As in, is that, you know, if, if uh, because all the rules and regulations, the way it's getting wired, it's, it's today we are essentially uh, almost like a skin over the exchanges and depositories, right? As in, there is, uh, you're not really left with any, uh, other than, of course, you know, reducing the systemic risk, right? Because brokers inherently reduce the risk for the MIS. But um, but apart from that, there isn't really uh, a need of a broker anymore, to be very honest. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so it, it, the one of the things that I always constantly think, you know, when someone asks me, Nathan, what will happen to broking industry in 10 years? It's like, dude, why do we, you know, if, if somehow, you know, the regulators figure a way to ring fence the MIS, do you really even need a broker is a question, you know? So, I mean, like I said, j- I'm, I'm putting this out there because most people watching this are most likely to be brokers and uh, and and kind of maybe share similar kind of concerns. Uh, but apart from that, I think it wise, uh, you know, we've, we've done some, you know, we've tried to, uh, you know, I've, I've spent some time in the US talking to brokers there. And, and I think, I think India is, uh, you know, in terms of regulations is exponentially better as in not, not in a, you know, in, in a multiple, I'm saying exponentially better than the way, uh, you know, how are, in, you know, investors are protected today, especially with the bunch of new things that have been introduced this, be it, you know, pledge repledge or be it EDIS instead of POA, be it, um, you know, be it this whole, you know, this funding of intraday leverages, et cetera, right? I mean, all of these regulations are game changers, you know, and I think, uh, you know, as and when there are no regulatory arbitrages of sorts, I think more brokers like us will come and try to innovate on the product and, uh, and, and which can potentially in turn grow the capital market ecosystem in this country, you know, so, so that's how I'm looking at all of this. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Nitin. And I also hope that there are no episodes in the capital market, which uh, encourage regulator to bring more regulations. Uh, uh, okay, I'll I'll go ahead with the follow-on questions. Uh, we discuss good things about capital markets and very progressive developments that have taken place in last couple of decades. Uh, my question to all panelists is whether you think there is any area where we have failed or we could do better. And obviously, it's apart from uh, you know what Navneet already answered that we are not being able to reach to the number of investors where we should reach considering the population of the country. And he you know, tried to connect it to mobile holders uh, for 1 billion or so. And I guess that we are having only two and a half, three, four percent uh, population, which is holding DMAT and investor account. Anything else where we failed? Or you can elaborate on this point, sir. Yeah, I mean, I can I can go at it first. Yes, <laughs> please carry on. Yeah, yeah. so. Uh, no, I think I think uh, while like you know when I look at some of the developed countries and see why have the ecosystems grown, I think it's because um, I mean there were the most of these ecosystems were advisory first, right? Where there aren't conflicts in the relationship itself, right? I mean one of the things I think uh, India's you know while there are great advisors for you know HNIs and over, we haven't been able to build that advisory ecosystem for HNI and below, right? As in, you know, above HNIs are taken care. I mean, right? As in, uh, because, you know, you walk into a bank today, you're probably sold an insurance policy for investment, right? As in, it's like that, you know, it's while, while these are, uh, uh, I mean, these are okay products, but then they're not the best products, right? And and there is always a conflict uh, when a person selling, 
uh, is making money from the manufacturers. I think I think what this country needs is is an advisory first ecosystem where the interests are aligned, where uh, the guy selling a product knows that he has to make money separately, you know, and not really from the manufacturer. So which means now he has to work harder to make the product transparent, right? As in, I, you know, if if I have to pay an advisor a certain fees. Uh, I need to know why he deserves that fees, which means advisor now needs to explain to me why he deserves a fee. And also, it, it just see a professional advisor will turn his customers professional, right? And, and and that's how the ecosystem can actually become professional. You know, you can't you can't expect uh, our country to be financially literate, educated if no one's taking the effort of actually going and educating, right? If everyone's got a conflict of not explaining the product because they don't want people to know that. You know what? I make a money out of. I make a buck out of this from someone, right? So it's. Uh, I think personally, uh, you know, that's something that we haven't gotten right yet, right? While SEBI has put in all the you know enablers in place with RI business, etc. I think now the reason why it hasn't happened is because we as Indians hate to pay fees as well, right? As in, I mean, that's also a problem, right? As in, like you know, if I were to go to a now, if I am an advisor and I go ask someone a fees, I mean, who's going to pay me the fees, right? As in, I think the way they have solved for it in a lot of developed market is. Is allowing custodians or brokers, etc., to debit the fees from the AUM itself, right? I, I mean, I think one of those, hopefully, you know, with all of these, uh, you know, uh, ways in which a broker is restricted today, maybe a broker, you know, should get this option to be able to collect an advisory fees from the AUM and pass it on to the advisor. Because if you make collection of advisory fees easy, right? right? Then you will have automatically have advisors, right? Today, advisors aren't there in plenty because they find it extremely tough to collect the fees. You know, I mean, if you go to a customer every end of every month and you have to ask for fees, you can't build a sustainable business model, right? As in, for 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 you to be able to build a sustainable business model, you need to have some kind of predictability in terms of your cash flows, and that comes into play if there is some kind of a mandate, etc., signed where you know the advisor is guaranteed that money is going to continue coming from the AUM. So, uh, so yeah, so this is. Probably what we haven't gotten right, but but like I said, you know the reason for it is is is, is plenty. You know, so. That's everybody's wish list in everybody's wish list. Right? So Navneet, uh, do you have any uh, you know, thought on this? Sure. So I think both you and uh, Nihal mentioned earlier that you know compared to where markets were in the 80s and early 90s, we have come a long way. And a matter of pride is that in several of those aspects whether moving 100% online trading to 100% dematerialization to the kind of transparency that has been brought uh, into the capital markets mutual fund, I think is extraordinary. I think we have been ahead of several developed markets. Even today, when you compare on variety of parameters, including the corporate governance, I think in terms of statute, we are ahead of several of the developed markets. Having said that, I think everybody has mentioned we have very, very long way to go. I would just mention one thing that, uh, and I think uh, Nitin in some manner uh, uh, kind of touched upon that, that I think the right balancing between allowing the market forces to work uh, versus the heavy hand of regulation. And I think we need to have that right balance, which is very, very critical. How do we ensure that innovation continues to uh, uh, flourish at the same time? You ensure that because you're dealing with somebody else's money and it's a very noble job, I mean, you ensure that through, I mean, of course, huge amount of investment and resources have been put into the surveillance, supervision, et cetera. I think a more focus on the supervision and uh, supervision and surveillance and maybe enforcement. And uh, over a period of time, we move more towards principles-based regulation, where I think you, you name the great guys who are doing very well and you shame the people who are not doing well. And that keeps a good restraint on one side that, uh, I mean, you have to do the right things. And at the same time, there is an appreciation of people uh, who work with uh, keeping the investor at the center, who keep the uh, uh, client at the center. And I think building that culture actually goes a long way, I would say, for any industry and more so in capital markets to get right kind of practices. And history is replete with a lot of examples where uh, uh, I think uh, a good balance between market forces uh, and, 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 and regulation, I think is very, very critical. Great, Namneet. Nehal, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think just one point which I want to add uh, is again, uh, focus on the regulatory side. Uh, I think uh, where we have uh, kind of uh, you know, being it has been difficult for regulators to drive regulation. Is that we have 
market where the range is extremely diverse. So you have very small investors, you have very large investors. Now the regulation, what we have tried to do is the socialization of regulation, as I call it, where we have one size fits all. And what that happens is that sometimes the regulation is too large. So the small guys, there can be risk for the small guys, or it's too stringent that the large guys can't do not have enough kind of the elbow. Room. So I think if we start, I think we've matured as a, a regulated markets. Probably we need to start thinking of creating segregation between protection and regulation. More the protection, more the regulation, less the protection, less the regulation. So the larger guys who do not mind having a little lower amount of protection, but will have more amount of elbow room uh, in terms of regulation versus the retail investors, which has higher level of protection, but higher level of regulation. I think that segregation, if we start moving towards, we've built all the building blocks towards that. But I think we need to now create a structure on this where we create segregations between regulation, not moving towards a one size fits all, but moving more towards a risk-based regulation, as I would put it, where the risk which is associated with a particular investor, the regulation would be commensurate with that. And with the use of technology, we can actually achieve this, where we can have what uh, SEBI has done it in a partial manner is something called a risk-based supervision, where if the intermediary is large, you have higher amount of audit and inspection versus a smaller one, which has uh, not that much, but the risk associated is less. So if we can graduate that to the investor level also, which can then we can have the product suitability and client suitability norms which are coming in, where if the client is sophisticated enough, he should be able to be marketed freely on uh, complex products, because if he loses money also, he has a wherewithal, the money and the might to take on the uh, intermediaries or the manufacturers to court and uh, get his money back. And the smaller guys who do not have that might or the money will be restricted to kind of more of the vanilla products, which are more straight driven, straight jacket in terms of the regulation. So what this will happen is that you allow everybody to uh, coexist rather than having a one size fits all from a regulation standpoint. I think this is something which uh, I do expect uh, as we move forward, it's going to start uh, coming into all facets of, of a financial. <clears throat> Very good food for thought uh, um, for regulator. Uh, I think I have to go very quickly now before I get the signal from Alo. Uh, so quick questions, Navini, uh, starting with Navneet. Uh, <clears throat> one of the expectations that an investor has from equities market is reasonable return. And indices indicate that uh, equities markets were able to deliver 15% odd YOY compounding rate of return in the last 30 years. Uh, do you think history will repeat and capital markets will be able to give this kind of returns in future as well? You are on mute, Namneet. This is the most spoken word words this uh, this year. You are on mute. <laughs> the uh, I mean, so one needs to look at a relative return rather than uh, or the real returns rather than absolute returns. So when you talk about the fifteen percent, look at where the inflation has been and where the uh, where, where the uh, the economic growth has been. I think uh, today, I mean, when you look at the overnight rate at 3% or you look at bond yields at like 4, 5, 6%, I think uh, if you get closer to a double digit return in equity, that should be a good expectation. And I think if, if the expectations are those, then I think you'll be positively surprised. Uh, that's what I believe. And over the last seven or eight years, corporate profits have been uh, much below even the nominal GDP growth. So over the overall nominal GDP growth uh, has come down, and within that the, corp the corporate profit growth has come down even more. There should be a mean reversion over the next five, seven, ten years, and I think with that, if your expectations are reasonable, there's a possibility that you get positively surprised. And if history is any guide, any period of five, seven, ten years where markets have delivered. Uh, uh, lower returns. I think the subsequent decade has been better for the uh, for the market. Uh, perfect, Tony. Uh, let me go to Nehal. 
Uh, Nehal, uh, an investor today has got a very transparent, uh, uh, I'll say very transparent regulations, best of the best trading platforms at lowest cost and best research and advisory services. Still, we see them falling prey to these traps of tips and news. My question to you is, where is the gap and how can we correct this? So I think it's a very, very pertinent question. I'll draw again an analogy that, uh, you know, in our family system, normally uh, a mother is always very, very partial towards the child. And, you know, uh, even the faults of the child, she generally, as we had the famous Mahabharata that Gandhari had put uh, uh, a kind of uh, blindfold over her eyes uh, so that she could not possibly see what was going wrong. And I think that is really the cause of the issue because the greed is the blindfold of greed which comes in where uh, um, people try to get uh, banking kind of returns using markets without really appreciating the risk which is associated with it and the transparency which is expected out of it. So if you see all the Ponzi schemes, which I have uh, kind of uh, been, uh, which have been prevalent and which have been caught are all driven by this singular uh, intent of greed, where they have been given fixed returns month on month, which are far in excess of the banking returns uh, using markets. And uh, people don't appreciate the necessity of risk. And they put on this blindfold of uh, greed uh, so that they don't even want to see for something which is shown to them, uh, whether it be your client statements, your DMAT accounts, uh, whether it be your uh, other billings which the intermediary mm -hmm. are supposed to do. And uh, some of those scrupulous intermediaries use that to kind of uh, leverage it to their, uh, basically their kind of an advantage, the creating a fraudulent screen, uh, scheme. Uh, what happens is that a few bad fish really spoil the pond and then everybody gets painted in the same manner. But this is the most important point that as much are the intermediaries responsible for the fraud, it's the investors also who are using or are being allowed uh, the, or are allowing the intermediaries to basically defraud them by not bringing in the relevant checks and controls, which are anyways available in terms of tools, which are available directly from the MIS. As I said, it's a B2C information flow. So you don't have to rely on your intermediary for the information flow. You have tools and SEBI has put a lot of such measures where the MIS are required to give an information flow directly to the investors. Start using that rather than uh, 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 believing that a person who's giving me a 15% return month on month or a 20% return month on month is going to be extremely faithful to me, honest to me, uh, and uh, do not kind of uh, put in the check. So stop being a mother to these bad children, but really becoming a teacher where you start con constantly being accountable or starting to check whether what has been promised is being delivered whether there is any fraud committed. And that is the responsibility of these investor education programs also, that investors also need to start being responsible towards themselves, start being responsible whether their money which has been invested is where it is intended to, it is not being diverted into some other form. So I think if this is focused upon and this as a cultural change comes into play, a lot of these uh, frauds will go away because a fraud can only occur if you have these gullible investors who are willing to be pulled in. Uh, rightly said, Nehan. My last question to Nitin. Uh, I think with the recent regulatory changes, uh, no broker will be able to provide any leverage. Discount broking as such is now offered across brokerage houses. Uh, front end online trading systems and back of systems are also almost common across uh, brokers. So, in these circumstances, what checkboxes should an investor take while selecting a broker? 
No, I, I don't I, see. The thing is, I think I think this is uh, just now about products, right? I think it's kind of moved away from uh, you know everyone has a similar uh, like a foundation to build a business on today. Like uh, uh, you know, of course, is this leverage good or bad? I personally, while it hurts our business, I think it's good. You know, this whole restriction on on leverages, uh, I think I think short term. I expect at least like a 20, 30% dip in our, in our revenues, right? And I think it's probably gonna be similar for everyone uh, who offers retail line business. So, uh, so yeah, so I think, I think it's about product. It's like, you know, when you buy a car, why do you buy a car, right? I mean, you like the way it looks, you like the way it drives, uh, you like a bunch of features and, you know, uh, whatever security, safety measures or whatever, right? I think, I think people selecting an, a broker going forward will almost be become become like you know how you select a mobile phone or how you select a car right as in you select all the features that you are looking for and the phone which has better features is going to win this race I, I don't think it's any more about cost i mean almost everyone is come down to the same pricing i mean when we started we were at 20 bucks a trade in 2010 uh, tender coconut used to cost us 10 rupees today it costs 40 rupees i mean we are still at 20 rupees a trade <laughs> and uh, i mean there's no inflation unfortunately in our business right i mean we are constantly you know fighting with each other to reduce the cost right so um, so i don't think i don't think cost is a differentiator i think uh, i think it's going to be product so i think games kind of i i personally think you know brokers who are looking at there are two ways to build a business one is you focus on products which is you know which requires you to have tech skills I don't think you can really build a product first business using vendors, right? I mean, if you are going to go outsource your, you know, building your product to someone else, I don't think you can really compete with someone who's going to build it in house and who's going to be a lot more nimble and faster. So yeah, so one is the product side of building a business. And two is, I think, like I said, right, the bigger problem in this country is to go, you know, help the customer invest better, right? As in, which is, you know, be that advisory first kind of a broker. And we, you know, someone like us, we are not really looking at solving that problem, right? As in, I think I think you know uh, traditionally brokers in India have been advisory first, right? Uh, I think I think I think people you know should do what is core competency to them, right? And not try to you know like if I play basketball tomorrow morning I can't get up and say I want to play cricket. You know it doesn't work. Like that. As in, I think I think these are two different ways of building businesses and uh, uh, and 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 we should all do what is core competency to us. So so coming back to your question. I think in terms of new client addition, et cetera, I think guys who got better products are going to win it, right? But in terms of just, uh, you know, growing the ecosystem, revenue, et cetera, it could be, you know, I think advisory first guys, you know, there will be a separate set of leaderboard for that. You know? So, uh, but yeah, but I think you have to take one side. I think uh, trying to take both the sides, I don't think uh, is going to help uh, anyone who's building a broking business there. You know? So point taken and many other brokers are relieved today after hearing you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so just one point, one point, Anurag, on a lighter note, in IPL, you have something called a fair play award. So all brokers <laughs> <laughs> so <I'm going, laughs> are going to really follow the regulations also is going to be a very key driver uh, of sustainability. So I have, uh, you know, started getting signals to close the session. But before that, uh, I want to ask a question from Navneen. Navneet, where do you invest your own money? As of now, it's all in SBI mutual fund. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he didn't want us to make a portfolio, right? So, uh, no, no, okay. It's the, 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 the scheme of the fund, it's all in mutual fund. A lot, I mean, most of it is in so perfect. So we had a great. I, I won't be a client of Nitin. I will be watching him very closely or whatever he's doing as a business <laughs> and as a, as a partner. Great session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so we had uh, good takeaways uh, from the session today. Navneet talked about the next hundred years uh, belonging to India and. Uh, he also raised the point that lot is, lot is already done and lot more is needed to be done to bring more investors and more money into the capital market. Neil beautifully explained and connected the role of Empire, Third Empire and DRS to regulations and MRIs. And he also gave us a, uh, you know, what is going to happen in future with integrated single DMAT account. Uh, Nitin, uh, 
beautifully explained about uh, you know his being into technology business and uh, investor should invest into entrepreneurs and entrepreneur should be able to uh, you know build further businesses and uh, also explained about why do we need stock brokers and rather he raised a question you know 10 years from now whether we'll be needing stock brokers and by the way nitin uh, most of the people attending this program are investors not brokers <laughs> uh, so thank you very much again uh, this had been very interactive and knowledge packed session and i'm sure that the audience uh, had lot of takeaways from the panel discussion over to alok uh, for taking the questions further thank you thank you anurag ji a lovely session with uh, navneet ji nehal and nitin uh, the three ends <laughs> i notice uh, before we move on a couple of lines come to mind our markets are safe prof profitable not so cheap and miles to go before sensex sleeps but i have compliances to keep so with this uh, let's move on to our next session